um, in, the, in the broadest possible view, what it's shown is that um, the tools uh, that the international humanitarian system can bring to bear in, uh, in, in this kind of a conflict are, are not really up to the job. Um, they don't fit uh, the task. And um, things that are, are usually worked around can be challenged and blocked um, by, by a variety of means. The whole um, question of uh, uh, the humanitarian principle as understood uh, in the Western dominated humanitarian system got so badly squeezed, you have to wonder whether um, they, they were really uh, anything other than shreds um, in some circumstances. We brought um, you know, the, the, the technocratic modern humanitarian toolbox to the table that needs assessment and log frames and uh, impact indicators and uh, all these uh, uh, good and uh, thoughtful um, techniques, but we were faced with an environment that was um, a, a data poor, a highly controlled, um, dangerous and difficult to access and uh, actively manipulated uh, on all sides. Then the, the, um, the pressure from the Western donors was very high to um, reach the opposition areas, regardless of whether there was uh, a greater or a lesser need or a greater or lesser number of people. And the, um, the fear of the state was that humanitarian aid would, um, the need for humanitarian aid would be used against them uh, as a Trojan horse to justify military intervention. Fresh from the Libya experience, uh, where the Security Council of the UN used the term protection and then uh, it turned into a bombing uh, exercise, um, they were very sensitive both to the uh, uh, instrumentalization of the, of the UN and also to the use of humanitarian need to delegitimize uh, a regime. Um, so the UN and the ICRC were uh, strangely lonely in this crisis. There were only a handful of uh, international NGOs who were themselves very constrained in what they could do. But we were very lonely, but we weren't necessarily able to, to, to fill the gap. Um, our neutrality and uh, universality sort of posture on both organizations, I think, allowed us to be there at all but it also uh, laid us open, uh, I can't speak for the ICRC, but it certainly laid the UN open to being uh, boxed in with um, multiple references to the primacy of the state, uh, General Assembly Resolution 46182, and a number of other uh, 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 precepts of international humanitarian law and practice that we really couldn't talk our, our way out of. Finally. Um, the, the social networks and civil society and mutual support um, that is covered in, in, in a number of articles in the magazine um, was on a very, very huge scale. And the amateurs perhaps um, did better than the professionals. So I, I leave you with the thought that maybe the lesson, one of the lessons from this is that um, it's not the professionalization of humanitarian aid that we need, but it's the amateurization. Why can't uh, self-organizing networks of committed citizens um, uh, help themselves and the international humanitarian machinery when it doesn't fit the task um, should be honest enough to say so or to change. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ben. Uh, very important thoughts, uh, mainly ending it with the civil society that is facing lots of challenges. But maybe we can uh, uh, explain to the audience here about what are the challenges on the ground inside Syria. Today, uh, more 100, than 100,000 killed, uh, 5 million internally displaced, uh, 2 million refugees. And uh, according to the UN, almost 9 million in need of help. That's almost 50% of the uh, population in need of help. And uh, Ben, you are operating on the ground with ICRC. Can you, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Sean, can you explain to us what are the challenges at the bureaucracy and what do you face to be able to deliver uh, the aid inside Syria? Thank, thank you, Lena. And um, I, think, I think Ben expressed it very, very eloquently, um, it, uh, painted a very uh, vivid, vivid, big picture of, of, of the situation. and. Um, uh, he's, he's absolutely right. Uh, you know, organizations working in Syria are incredibly boxed in. Um, um, and I think he's also very right about uh, the role of, of local organizations in, in, in helping Syrians to help themselves. I think, though, that, that it's very important to, to understand 
that the nature of the compromise, the fundamental compromise that exists for organizations there is between what they aim to do and what they're actually able to do. So, so, th so, that, so, so it's, not, it's not that organizations are wanting to sacrifice uh, the principle of, of universality or the principle of neutrality or impartiality, but th th the main compromise that, ha that is made all the time is between what you want to do and what you're able to actually achieve given the environment in which you're, you're, you're forced to work. So let's talk a little bit about that, that environment. Uh, I mean, the key uh, factor for an organization like uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross um, is uh, the high levels of insecurity throughout the country. Um, and that insecurity takes the most uh, basic form um, of, of, of shelling, shooting, sniper fire, um, active military combat operations, um, low level um, uh, insurgent style, uh, military activity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That is the most fundamental impediment to to free movement and the ability to 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 meet the needs um, of the people. The second major impediment is um, is, if you like, the sort of uh, bureaucratic organisational um, impediments that 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 any organisation working in Damascus um, necessarily faces uh, through having to deal with the institutions of the Syrian state. Uh, which um, have their uh, own priorities and which uh, exercise considerable control over any organization that's working on territory uh, it controls. Um, so that's around uh, uh, entry permits, visas, um, uh, import licenses, um, uh, uh, daily permissions on where you can and cannot go, um, and those are um, you know, fundamental breaks, massive uh, pieces of friction that prevent you from being able to achieve what you want to achieve. And the third um, uh, uh, major problem um, an organization like the ICRC faces is just the outright refusal um, of uh, the government and also um, armed opposition groups to allow you to uh, reach uh, the places you feel you should be able to reach, you need to reach, um, to meet the needs of uh, people which are uh, extreme, large, and um, uh, well beyond uh, what we are able to meet at, at, at the moment. So uh, the, the best examples um, of that are the besieged areas, the old city of Homs, Muadamiya, Eastern Ghouta, where despite persistent requests for a period of almost a year, uh, we at the ICRC have been unable to, to get into those areas um, and uh, can, only, can have to rely on second-hand information as to the situation there for, for people. We hear alarming reports of hunger. We hear alarming reports of uh, people dying of injuries that can't be treated because uh, we're not allowed to get medical supplies in there. So um, there are a number of, of very major uh, obstacles to us uh, being able to uh, do the work we feel we're there to do uh, and, and, that, and that we want to do. And I'll just finish by saying, uh, something very briefly about uh, the Syrian Arab Red, Red Crescent. I know we'll come on to this later on. Um, uh, the Syrian Arab Red Crescent are the sort of implementing partner uh, for uh, humanitarian dis uh, assistance distribution throughout the country. Um, that's a government decision, not their decision. Um, the UN agencies work through them as well. They have a, a very wide uh, branch network. Um, and the ICRC, as part of the Red Cross Red Crescent movement, uh, would automatically work with the National Society in any country where it's operating, um, and SARC is the National Society there. Um, it's staffed by many thousand uh, very brave volunteers working uh, in, in, in impossibly difficult conditions, um, very representative of the communities they serve. Um, they're present all across the country. Um, uh, but it faces, you know, it is, it's boxed in as well. It faces uh, a, a, as much of a, a challenge as, as any of the international organizations in trying to ensure it can survive, in trying to protect its people, uh, and in trying to make sure uh, aid can get where, 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 wherever it can. Um, so so uh, I think there's an interesting discussion to be had around neutrality. Um, I think universi universality, that one was lost long ago in Syria. Neutrality, what is it there for, what does it do? Uh, the key one for us, the key one for the ICRC is impartiality. Um, on the ground um, in, in terms of trying to assist um, solely on the basis of need without regard to, to, to affiliation 
Um, and that's a, that's a, that's a principle we, 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 we are unhappy that we are unable to um, uh, deliver in, in, in practice, uh, but we're very far away from um, uh, ever giving up on uh, in, in, in theory. Um, thank you very much, uh, Sean. And you mentioned the uh, Red Crescent uh, uh, workers in Syria and volunteers. And in fact, they are very brave, although there is lots of criticism provide, uh, uh, provided to SARC. Uh, but at the same time, there are brave people there. 22 of them uh, were killed during the conflicts while they are trying to do their job. And many are detained behind uh, government cells as well because of doing uh, their job or being in the uh, front line and hotline. And probably you can uh, both uh, Ben and uh, and uh, Sean explore more about uh, uh, this uh, impartiality as well trying to deliver the aid for wherever is needed on both sides of the, con the conflict on negotiations on the behind the scene diplomacy that is taking place on both sides with the government but also negotiations with the rebels Ben thank you um I'm, I'm sure this audience is very familiar with the, uh, some of the shape of the restrictions, but just very briefly, um, uh, national uh, staff, I think it's actually 32 uh, SARC volunteers or staff have been killed and 12 uh, UN Syrian staff as well, um, including Palestinian Syrians. So um, the bureaucracy uh, for international aid begins with the visas. Um, visas were extremely limited in number also in duration, often they took weeks to arrive and then they were single entry and only three months. Only some nationalities were acceptable. The list of nationalities shrank uh, quite fast as the uh, so-called Friends of Syria grew in proportion. Um, to do anything requires uh, multiple pieces of paper. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs puts itself fair and square uh, as the coordinator and the veto power over all international action. And um, uh, even when you do have the paperwork, which is uh, sort of Kafkaesque and Orwellian in equal proportions, you may still be stopped, turned back, looted, or beaten up at a checkpoint um, by whichever armed uh, force mans it. Um, we were uh, played well uh, by, the, by uh, the state in particular. Uh, they gave just enough to, to keep um, the, the greater uh, threats at bay. We asked uh, so many times, and then we were given one or two things, one or two crumbs, and then the same thing is happening this month with the extra pressure, um, uh, diplomatic pressure on Syria. Um, we note that uh, permission has been granted for a couple more um, uh, bases outside Damascus. A few more visas have been approved. So we were on a sort of starvation diet of personnel, resources, uh, movement, access, and um, we were also under uh, considerable levels of surveillance and uh, manipulation. Um, it was also pretty dangerous and noisy. Uh, frankly, Mogadishu is very quiet by comparison to Damascus. We would um, also uh, find problems in um, very simple things like the um, customs procedures and uh, the clearance of uh, very harmless goods. Some goods, relief goods, were regarded by the authorities in Damascus as dual use. Um, in that sense, I'm referring to surgical IV drips and uh, uh, that kind of equipment, which could be used to patch up a wound as equally as it could be used to um, uh, help a woman with a difficult labor. So um, this problem still continues. Also, there was a, a pretty much uh, a overwhelming lack of uh, openness on numbers, and the ability to, to do um, surveys in the field was extremely limited. We were once told by a colleague, if you do try and do an assessment in the field, you better have a good memory, because as soon as you pull out a clipboard, you're going to have the plainclothes security all over you, and uh, you're not going to be able to continue. So um, all of this uh, is sometimes called bureaucratic, but in reality, it's deliberate, it's systematic, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, willful. There is a bureaucratic element, and one of the peculiarities of Syria reminds me a little bit of Ethiopia, that there are, is a, a tendency to make lists and numbers and names and take records. And in fact, there is phenomenal detail out there in the field, but it's, uh, it doesn't flow um, upward to Damascus, certainly not to the outside agencies. 
So let me stop there. The list of restrictions is endless, frankly. Um, thank you, Ben. Maybe, Sean, you want to elaborate about the impartiality and negotiations with both sides to deliver the aid? Yep, thank you, um, Ben and Lena. I think the, 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 just, to, just to add to what Ben said, he, he outlined the, the, the real uh, challenges, day-to-day -day challenges of sort of getting anywhere and doing anything. Um, you know, it's, it's the nature of, of the ITRC to, um, to negotiate its way forward um, uh, and get acceptance for what it's trying to do. Um, that's that's our that's our kind of our, our fundamental modus operandi, um, but that is incredibly difficult in Syria. Um, uh, as Ben said, uh, you are often played, um, and the uh, the your interests, which are you hope um, uh, the, the the needs of, of meeting the needs of people, are not often, not always, hardly ever the interests of the people you're negotiating with. So, um, for instance, we have for a long time been trying to get back into the old city of Homs and um, uh, we're recently uh, appeared to be on the verge of, of, of getting back in there. Um, but we were told um, straight out that uh, we could not bring medical supplies in there. Um, and we had been told by, uh, through our contacts in the old city of Homs, that listen, you know, if you can't bring medical supplies in here, don't bother coming. So, um, for both sides, this issue of medical assistance had become, you know, you know, a weapon of war, um, and that's absolutely si the situation now uh, across the whole of the country. Where, um, although we can move across front lines um, through a process of negotiation, difficult negotiation, we are prevented by the government from bringing medical supplies across those front lines. Um, and uh, currently, I in Syria, the um, uh, denial of medical assistance is 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 become um, a a lever, another lever, uh, through which um, uh, force can be uh, exercised over um, areas um, uh, outside the control of, of a party. Um, ironically, um, when we were able to distribute medical supplies uh, across lines in the north of the country in an area where uh, a, a government, a government, to a government-held area surrounded by uh, opposition forces. Um, um, on our way back through opposition-held areas, um, uh, a number of our team members were, were kidnapped, um, and uh, three out of the seven people who were kidnapped uh, remain, remain uh, held. Um, so this is just to give you um, an indication of um, the interplay of, of um, negotiated access, um, uh, hostile forces, um, outright um, prohibitions, um, and uh, the fluid nature of, of, uh, of, of, of power and um, authority in different parts of the country, particularly in the north, which is very, very hard to, um, to keep up with to, and to understand, um, but which you have to g have a strong grip on if you're going to be able to move through those areas uh, and, deliver, and deliver assistance. Um, thank you. It's a difficult and complicated situation. In fact, it's dangerous. And as you mentioned, that uh, the humanitarian aid and mainly uh, medical aid is one of the dangerous uh, issues to face in Syria. Government forces are targeting hospitals, arresting doctors, and even uh, even uh, uh, nurses who are uh, providing some medicines to a uh, rebel held area. But these days, it's becoming even more complicated uh, with the uh, extremist elements in, in the north that are kidnapping uh, aid workers. But let's, uh, we'll go back to uh, um, aid provided uh, cross-border and talk to Emmanuel about, uh, about the ethical and legal side of it. But before that, we would like to hear from, uh, uh, from uh, Matthew about uh, uh, DFIT is a Syria crisis uh, unit. You have uh, provided assistance to the assistance uh, coordination unit that is established by the uh, Syrian National Coalition in 2012. Can you tell us uh, about uh, your support Support to this unit and your activity in general as well. Okay. Yes, I'm, I'm very happy to do that. I mean, perhaps starting with the with the second point around uh, 
uh, DFID's activity in general, the British government's activity in general um, in Syria. I mean, overall, the British government has got three kind of very clear priorities within Syria. Um, sorry, I'm not speaking enough into the microphone. Yeah. Um, I mean, they are essentially that we want to uh, alleviate suffering at the moment. We want to support a political solution. And obviously, um, we're pleased that the Geneva II talks uh, are now going to be going ahead in January, because we think that that's the best opportunity for a political settlement um, in Syria and a transition to a democratic and free uh, Syria. And then thirdly, we want to uh, do everything we can to make sure that Assad can't use chemical weapons again. So to come to the first of those, the alleviation of suffering, um, we're, we've provided so far the, Br the, British, uh, the, the British aid effort uh, in the Syria crisis 500 million pounds since the beginning of the crisis, which is more than we've provided for any other crisis, and I think you know is commensurate, commensurate with the uh, huge scale of the need that other speakers have already spoken about. Um, and that assistance is both within Syria itself and also in the in the countries around Sy uh, in the countries where uh, refugees have gone to. So, to come to your second point of the question with the ACU, um, with such a huge investment in the in in seeking to alleviate suffering and, and meet humanitarian needs, we really need a lot of partners, and we really want all the partners that we can get in order to be able to make sure that the assistance we provide is effective, and the assistance more generally the international community provides can be effective. Um, and in terms of the ACU, as as you said, Lina, it's been set up by the. Uh, by the uh, National Coalition um, to uh, both channel assistance and also be able to facilitate the provision of assistance. And we provided some support to the ACU early on to help it to think through exactly where it could add value and what it, what it might be able to, to do best. And also to build its capacity, in particular in a couple of areas where we think it can make and has made a real, uh, a real contribution. First of all, in assessments, in getting better information in the, in the north of Syria about what are the conditions of people, where are the needs, and how can they best be met. Um, and particularly also on the medical side, understanding you know, where, where, are, where are there risks of outbreaks of epidemics and so on. So they've done work, the study called the JRANS, which essentially is the assessment work, and uh, some work kind of analogous to work done by um, other organizations elsewhere on the medical side. And I think that's really where we see the, the added value of the ACU in, uh, obviously it's, a, it's part of the, uh, the national coalition, so therefore it has very important political links, which are extremely important when you're trying to operate uh, in that area. And I think it has a very important role to play in facilitation and in ensuring that there is good information for other partners and you know, the, the various organizations that are delivering assistance. Uh, thank you, but I have a question here that is raised by many people inside Syria, like uh, millions of dollars uh, in aid going, UN is operating, ICRC is operating, yet you hear there's still a uh, complaint inside uh, the country that not enough is done. Uh, can you elaborate on how are you guaranteeing that the money you're sending is actually reaching, reaching the people who are in need? And maybe you both can, uh, can follow up on that as well. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it, there's no point providing funding if it's not going to be used for the purposes intended, if it's diverted or stolen or abused in any way. Um, I mean, that we have a number of ways in which we are doing our very best to make sure that, uh, that the, the British assistance is not diverted in, in that way. And the main one of those is that all the assistance we provide, we, pr we channel through very well-established and trusted organizations. Essentially, in the main, they're the United Nations agencies, there, the Red Cross family, ICRC, of course, is, uh, is a very valued partner for us and doing absolutely fantastic work. And then a range of non-governmental organizations, including UK international, uh, 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 international NGOs, um, which work with partners on the ground and have very well-established monitoring and reporting mechanisms. Um, we also have a system whereby you know, they will report to us if there are any cases of diversion or of assistance not getting through. And so far, I have to say, we haven't had um, reports coming through of diversion of our assistance, but it is something, obviously, in a situation such as Syria, which is such a chaotic and very difficult situation, it's something that one has to be very, very vigilant about all the time. Um, Sean, do you want to elaborate on that? Uh, 
Not, not much on that. I mean, we have um, well-established systems. I think in terms of, uh, of, of well-established systems of, of, of making sure that we spend um, our donors' money, um, for which we're very grateful, um, uh, uh, wisely and, and effectively. Um, and we are, what we feel in, in Syria itself is it's not a lack, of, uh, it's not a lack of, of money that's the problem. It's the, actually the inability to spend it uh, in the places that, that it's needed. If you can't get to the places um, where where there is need, there's 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 no point, you know, buying a lot of aid and having it sit in sit in warehouses and tooling up to do a massive operation. If if you, you know if, if it's if it's if the government's not or the rebels are not going to allow you to 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 do what you what you what you feel uh, is needed to be done. I think in terms of money, I think the wider refugee um, uh, situation outside the borders of of Syria. Is where there are shortfalls, um, but uh, but I think you'd have to ask the wider UN family for a bit more detail on that. I'm not I'm not up to speed on that. Uh, we'll go. We'll come to the refugee uh, question uh, later on. But uh, since talking about the delivery of uh, uh, of the aid, we'll come to some organisations have been working cross border. And Emanuela, in your article, you talked about the ethical and legal um, issue of uh, cross border aid. Can you? Uh, tell us about this. Is this something that could be done or legal inside Syria? Absolutely. And I think it's, it's important to understand that the law is essential to ensure that those who are considering cross-border operations are operating lawfully. <laughs> However, the law is not the answer by itself, nor the only element to consider. Policy and operational uh, considerations are equally important. The lawfulness of a particular course of action in no way ensures the safety both for the beneficiaries and for those people carrying out the operations. So it's for these reasons that for most humanitarian actors, the decision of whether to carry out relief operations, cross-border operations in particular, without the consent of the affected state, is a principally a policy decision informed by the law. Um, in very simple terms, the rules regulating humanitarian assistance are straightforward. Primary responsibility lies with the party to the conflict that has control over the population. If this party is unable or unwilling to meet the needs, humanitarians can, uh, states or humanitarian organizations can offer to carry out relief actions that are exclusively <coughs> humanitarian and impartial in character. The consent of the affected parties is required for such operations, and I'll return to this in a second. And then once relief operations have been agreed to, all parties must allow and facilitate rapid and unimpeded passage of the relief operations. These rules apply both to in-country and cross-border operations. The modalities <coughs> are irrelevant. Obviously, there are additional factors to take into account if you're carrying out cross-border operations, most notably the consent of the state from whose territory you intend to operate. So in, in relation to Syria, I think principally Turkey is the country from which they're operating. Obviously, it's essential that that state agrees to the operations. The key sticking point in Syria is, uh, is the requirement of consent of the affected parties. Um, now, there have been instances in the past where assistance was carried out cross-border with the consent of the affected parties uh, in, the, in Iraq from 2003 to th 2006. Many of the operations were cross-border because of the security situation. However, there wasn't an issue of consent. Similarly, Operation Lifeline Sudan, uh, all the parties agreed to it. Um, an example that, that Hugo gives in our article where there wasn't consent was the relief operations in the civil war in Biafra. Uh, on that occasion, there was no government consent. And as he says, some of the relief, relief planes were shot down. So obviously, consent is essential. There's a divergence of view among lawyers as to which party's consent is required, uh, particularly where the opposition holds territory. Is, um, does the government need to give consent to all operations, or is the consent of the rebel group sufficient if its territory can be reached across the border from, um, from neighboring states? Um, I'm happy to go through the various legal discussions later, perhaps in the uh, question and answer session, much as I would like to say that the consent of the affected state, in this case Syria, is not required if somehow 
operations can be carried out from neighboring states. I'm afraid that's not actually a realistic reading of the law, nor as a matter of practice um, is it realistic. For operations to be carried out in safety, it is necessary to have the agreement of all parties concerned. Um, where the law does give us some leeway is the requirement that consent, although required, must not be arbitrarily withheld. Now, although this is a central element of the rules, there is no clarity as to what constitutes valid or arbitrary reasons for withholding consent. Valid reasons uh, could be imperative considerations of military necessity, such as ongoing combat operations. Arbitrary reasons could be, for example, a desire to weaken the enemy by depriving the civilian population of its means of subsistence. And I think two fairly uncontroversial arbitrary reasons that are of particular relevance today um, relate to withholding of consents that would violate the state's other international law obligations. So one controversial example where withholding consent would be arbitrary and therefore unlawful are situations where the civilian population is facing starvation. Withholding consent in such circumstances would be a violation of the prohibition of starvation of the civilian population. A second example, again, I think extremely pertinent today, is withholding consent to, re uh, to medical relief operations on the ground that medical supplies and equipment could be used to treat wounded enemy combatants. It's a fundamental rule of international humanitarian law that the wounded and sick including enemy combatants, must receive the medical care to which that they need without any delay. Um, and no distinction can be made on grounds other than medical ones. So therefore, what we are seeing, which is withholding consent to medical operations on the ground that they could somehow treat the enemy wounded combatants, is clearly a violation of international law. And as one of the speakers said, um, it's not just the wounded enemy combatants that are denied the medical treatment to which they're entitled. It's also civilians who are in need of the same surgical equipment. So I'd say that's a very clear instance in relation to that specific type of relief uh, operation where we are witnessing um, what appears to be a, an arbitrary withholding of consent. Unfortunately, where does that leave us? And um, uh, counterintuitively, as a matter of law, the fact a party is arbitrarily withholding consent doesn't give rise to a general entitlement on all actors to carry out unauthorized relief operations. As I, say, I always feel a bit embarrassed when I say this, that's just the way the law it is. It's completely counterintuitive, but that's not how it works. Um, and a, a difference has to be drawn between the actors involved. If we're talking about states or international organizations, um, at best, their unauthorized operations um, could be justifiable violations of the state's uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity under what's known as the principle of necessity, which, some, which, which justifies an otherwise unlawful act. But even that would only be in extremely limited circumstances. For example, one-off relief operations by states or international organizations to bring life-saving supplies to a population in a specific location that is suffering severe need when no other alternatives exist. The position is, is different for, for private actors such as NGOs. They are not bound by the same rules. They're not bound by the prohibitions in international law on violating state sovereignty, um, territorial integrity. So um, while they could carry out such cross-border operations, they face a different problem because their staff faces the risk of criminal proceedings before the domestic courts of the states where they're carrying out these unauthorized operations, ranging from illegal entry to support to the enemy, or to, in fact even uh, assistance to, to terrorism. And in fact, we have seen that in an attempt to, to tighten uh, the to to clamp down who is coming into the territory, both in, in, in order to fight, but it can have an impact also on unauthorized um, relief operations. Uh, Syria has, in fact, criminalized uh, unauthorized entry into the country, obviously something of significant importance for, for NGOs. 
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Manuela. But if, if the cross-border is on offer, what are the options there then? Well, the other option open to states and international organizations <laughs> would be the provision of indirect assistance, therefore providing goods or funds to actors that are operating in country. They wouldn't cross the border. They wouldn't be violating territorial integrity or sovereignty. They would be assisting those who are already there. Obviously, if they're assisting actors who are there with the authorization of the regime, everything is fine. Far more ch problematic is the situation where they are assisting unauthorized <laughs> operations. In those circumstances, they open themselves to the risk of assisting in the commission of a wrongful act. As a matter of law, probably not a justifiable claim, but definitely one that I think would be aired by the government. Also, looking beyond the purely legal dimension, this kind of support would give greater um, publicity, possibly, to operations that are, until now, accepted, tolerated, but this external support could give, give the risk that they would no longer be accepted because they have greater publicity. Uh, ben, so far the Syrian government uh, is only allowing the aid to be coming through its own uh, uh, um, uh, doors and not uh, to come through cross-border. UN is not able to operate or deliver aid across the border, uh, neither ICRC. Are there any options uh, are ongoing? Can you tell us about discussions or other uh, plans that are taking place? The UN was going to issue um, a resolution, a UN Security Council resolution about for delivering humanitarian aid, but it's still uh, on hold. Can you elaborate, please? Um, the, the Security Council, after um, uh, more than a year, finally came up with a presidential statement which uh, does not have any legal authority. Um, we're re requesting that aid be allowed to cross in the most uh, efficient manner, uh, whichever route that might be. And um, there's been a number of uh, leaked documents this month um, showing how uh, the UN is, is trying to take that resolution uh, into reality with uh, very limited success. I think the only change is that uh, a shipment was allowed from Iraq into the Kurdish Northeast, um, but that's uh, uh, controlled by a group um, on, uh, in some sort of um, affiliation with Damascus. So it would not count as a cross-border delivery to a, a rebel-held territory. So um, that's, that's where we are. Um, there's not much chance of a Security Council resolution authorizing um, such a, a cross-border delivery to, to rebel-held territory, uh, as far as I know. Sean, what's uh, the ICRC's position on this? I think, it, I think it's useful just to, sort of, you know, to give a little bit of context on this particular discussion. Um, you know, essentially, the question is, uh, could, we, could the problems in Syria be um, resolved if um, aid was allowed to flood across the borders um, into, into opposition-held areas, and, um, and, and could those areas then be, 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 be uh, fed, and, and could the injured people there be treated uh, with medicine that's freely able to, to, to come across, and uh, aid that was going in via Damascus could take care of, 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 of all the needs on, on the government side. Um, it's a nice idea, it's a nice picture to, to, to paint, Unfortunately, the political reality doesn't allow that uh, to to um, uh, to to come into being. Um, uh, you know, and, and in a simplistic way, people say, "Well, why why can why can this not happen? Why can't it happen?" And I think Emanuela has kind of laid out um, uh, some of the kind of the, the reasons under international law and, un, and under under the kind of the principles of sovereignty why w why uh, that kind of uh, supposedly simple solution you know can't cannot occur. Let's be let's be clear. The Syrian government has said that to any organisation that's working in Damascus, listen, if you do anything unauthorised, um, coming across the border in a way that you know that you don't tell us about it, we will shut you down. So, so uh, you know, organisations working through Damascus are, are have to kind of make 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 judgments. What's the you know to what an extent um, uh, do we put at risk 
uh, what uh, access we do have, however limited it is, however constrained it is, um, and continue to negotiate and continue to push from within? Um, or to what extent do we say, um, right, okay, let's go for it, let's take a risk, let's take the plunge? Now, for the big kind of, int the, for, for the UN, part of the you know, international system, for the ICRC, which has a kind of, uh, you know, an existence uh, status conferred upon it by, in by international law, we are, it, those organizations are just um, going to have to deal with the political reality of, of, of a strong centralized state government that we, that we have to negotiate with. Other organizations, not part of the kind of the international state uh, apparatus, international state system, if you like, have more freedom to, to try to, to look at the balance of risk and reward, particularly if they're not uh, got permission to operate um, uh, in Damascus, and then say, well, okay, well, what can we do to go across borders and operate under the radar and try and bring assistance to areas um, uh, w where, where that's needed? Um, you know, we at the ICRC, we've asked to go across border and we've not been, we've not been given permission to do so. Um, and we have said, listen, we don't want to make this a political football, this issue of cross border <laughs> versus, versus cross line, um, because, because, um, you know, we don't want, uh, the issue of where aid goes to be, to be, um, driven along, um, your, along the basis of whether you owe allegiance to the Serbian government or, or to someone else. Um, our argument is let's, let's just refer solely and simply to humanitarian need and argue on that basis uh, to be able to cross, cross lines or cross borders uh, to meet those needs. Now that's an argument that's, 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 um, that's sometimes been successful, it's sometimes secured as access across lines, not as often as we would like, not as often as is needed, but it's not yet ever uh, gotten us access across borders. Thank you. That will bring us to the question about who are the other uh, powers who are working on the ground. The UN and the ICRC are not able to deliver cross-border. They have restrictions with bureaucracies, and sometimes it's politicized by the Syrian government. It's the civil society that's operating on the ground. And Marwa, you have great experience in human care um, uh, foundation that you have set up here in Syria with Syrian exiles, basically trying to support the locals on the ground. Can you explore on that and bring this experience to, to the audience, please? So the organization um, that I work for um, is a Syrian-led organization by not necessarily exiles, but um, expatriates here in the diaspora um, who've been here f f in the UK for a while. As a result of the conflict, they came together um, and set up organizations to initially deliver medical assistance. Now, as time has gone on, the, the programs that we are delivering are far more technical um, than medical assistance. I mean, the, the, the conflict has gone on now for two years. We're talking about dealing with situations of, uh, you know, issues of malnutrition, issues of uh, typhoid epidemics are, are, are coming, you know, are arising. And that's the kind of the nature of the, the, the programs uh, and the problems that we have that we are trying to find solutions for. You know, the diaspora is, 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 is could be one of the other. We are working on the ground through our local network. Our team is led by Syrians on the ground um, who are employed by us here in the UK. Um, they work in, um, according to um, international, uh, you know, inter international standards in terms of the programs that we deliver. Um, and we, they and us share the same values. They are assumed to be criminals by um, by the authorities, um, sadly, because they are providing assistance in the same way that we've seen, I think, uh, 32 um, SARC members uh, fall as a result of, of of the conflict. Anyone who is providing assistance um, is, is labeled as a criminal, if you like, sadly. What we would like to see um, happen is to to, to build, f to further build the capacity of the local diasporas. The diasporas in the UK working on the ground through their partners. Our, our staff on the ground are people who have um, volunteered with the uh, SARC in the past, um, people who've been involved with the local um, NGOs, uh, local uh, pre pre prior to the, to the conflict. Um, and, and that's how they, they continue to work. We share, they, for us, the question of legality um, is we're working on a humanitarian imperative and we believe that 
yes, um, we are there doing th the right job um, uh, and, and supporting those in need because it's a matter of life and death. When, when there was cross-border intervention in, in Homs, uh, um, s probably around a year ago when we were providing medical assistance, that was a question of life and death. That is a question of people um, getting the medical aid to them or not. And people have, I in return for the medical aid and, and the, the equipment that we did send, have are, are now alive and are now living. Um, sadly, the conflict's gone on so much that it's not just a question of um, like I said, medical assistance, and and that's why humanitarian actors need to bring the diaspora to the table and and, and to bring together the local partners, the local civil societies, uh, you know, level organisations that are working tirelessly on the ground, uh, building that who who we together have built a network with them to to access um, aid and to work yes in an impartial way. We provide assistance impartially to those in need. If someone comes to me from either side and says, I need um, a blanket, you give them a blanket. I mean, uh, th in the very same way that SARC is working or any other international organization, in the same way that the UN is working, we are we adhere to those principles and those practices, and that's what we are, we are putting into place. Um, in terms of... Um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Just bear with me. <laughs> Sorry, if you I'll have follow up with a question follow with up, you. Yeah, yeah. if uh, today, like the work on humanitarian aid or medical aid, is very risky inside Syria, and the locals who are paying the price, being detained or targeted, how did you manage from your position outside to liaise and coordinate with them, also guaranteeing their own safety, safety from uh, when they when they receive the, uh, the the aid or safety when they deliver it, safety from uh, security or from bombardment. Okay. The answer is we can't guarantee anything. Um, we've actually lost um, one of our personnel in, in Homs, uh, I think now back in March. Um, and, and, and that's the reality. The people that we are working with are, are educated people on the ground that want to provide something for their fellow, uh, you know, for their fellow Syrians, for the fellow people who are, who are in need of assistance. And, and they share the same values as us. These are people who, who are taking it upon their responsibility um, on their own personal um, accord to to work with us um, and to deliver their to deliver assistance. We sadly cannot guarantee their safety. There are questions um, of bombing. There are questions of shelling um, from both sides. We, you know, you you have to paint the picture as it is. They are under um, you know r risk from both sides. Because we are working as locals in Syria, we haven't had so many issues um, with the rebels um, per se. Um, we, we've been, you know, as long as they see Syrian faces um, with our experience, they've been quite comfortable to um, to negotiate and, and to work. When there are instances of, you know, foreign actors coming in um, and they see foreign faces, that's when the the Islamists or or the radicals or whoever party it is are, you know, putting a question mark on on this assistance. But otherwise, as a Syrian and as a local um, working on the ground. So far, touch wood, uh, our personnel are, are, you know, otherwise are, are okay. Um, in terms of neutrality, um, we are, you know, there's a question of how neutral can organisations be, uh, newly born organisations. Um, we work as neutrally and as impartially as is possible. Um, in we provide assistance in, in, in government-held areas um, according to the priority and, and according to the needs um, of those um, who of the suffering on the ground um, and in those areas we work without a banner we don't work as human carers here we work as as a local we work completely um, kind of um, you want to say underground or in the candle stand sadly that's what we have to do um, in order to get the um, to the aid to those in need and that also means that we can protect to as, as much as possible our, our personnel um, and, and to ensure that they can continue providing the aid because without them we would not be able to continue doing uh, the great work um, and, and the great work they are doing um, because we're here sat in, in London very comfortable but it's them who are really risking their lives um, to make a difference and to help others. Thank you very much, Marwa. Uh, Matthew, you are helping the, uh, you supported the Assistant Coordination Unit, who is also helping organizations inside Syria. But have you uh, reached out to other um, NGOs or civil society organizations inside the country to support them? What type, type of support and what did you manage to deliver so far? 
Okay, well, thank you very much for that. I mean, the way that we work within DFID is that, as I mentioned before, we work with very trusted partners, the UN agencies, the ICRC, the uh, international NGOs on the whole. So um, they, they are our main partners. They, in turn, of course, are working with many others. And we've just heard from, uh, from Sean about the work that the ICRC is doing with, the, um, with, the, uh, with, with SARC, for example. So we don't work, DFID is not working directly with those organizations within Syria, but some of our partners are. And they are delivering. I mean, they are delivering a lot. For example, at the moment, I think we are, through our funding, delivering food for over 300,000 people per month, and in Syria itself, water for almost a million people a month. So a lot is happening. I mean, I think we've spoken a lot today, and very rightly spoken. I think we'll no doubt speak some more about the denial of access and the use of denial of access as a tool of war uh, and as a military tactic, particularly by the regime all of which is true, all of which needs to be addressed. But I think the other side of the coin that's really important to get through is that a lot of assistance is getting through. And I think we've heard some from uh, my colleague here about some of the ways in which it is possible to get assistance through. And I think it's really important we don't lose sight of that, um, that dreadful and terrible as the situation is, um, and very culpable, as particularly as the regime is, um, nevertheless, you know, there is a lot of assistance, whether it's cross-line or cross-border or in areas controlled by the regime where organizations are able to get assistance through the people who need it. And it's very important we remember that because we need to continue to make sure that we are raising the resources and building the confidence of the general public that we actually can make a real difference and are making a real difference. Using this uh, humanitarian aid as a political tool, uh, Ben, I'll come back to you. To, in the last couple of months, there was uh, a lot of sieged areas, especially in uh, Damascus and rural Damascus. And there was a policy used and has been reported widely by uh, the government, uh, has been reported by journalists, but the policy used by the government or surrender or starve. Uh, how far negotiations behind, behind the scene are able to deliver and change? That's one part. And the other part I want to ask you, how far the UN and ICRC are able to work with local NGOs inside the country away from working through the government channels, official channels like uh, SARC? If you can elaborate, uh, Ben, please. The, the question of besieged areas was one that we raised uh, uh, repeatedly um, in almost every discussion we held with the, uh, with the government. Um, they uh, consistently had a position that we could go anywhere and we could deliver anywhere, but in practice, um, often uh, security problems, so-called, or other hurdles came up at the last minute. Um, and so in fact, it was, it was unable, uh, it was not possible to, to penetrate. The old city in Homs is the, is the most uh, famous example. And um, you know, we, we, we were up there uh, for the aid um, before last, when there was supposedly a ceasefire um, that was uh, lasted about 10 minutes, frankly. And, um, I think the government uh, would have perhaps allowed a couple of trucks into the old city, but by the time you know all the different uh, arms of the security apparatus had been consulted, our trucks had been completely unloaded and loaded back up on a checkpoint outside the, the main Homs uh, ring road, um, and the different uh, 26 at least different factions of armed groups inside the old city uh, were, were uh, attempted to be contacted. You can imagine, you know, the, the ceasefire was over by the time we had um, got anywhere near uh, the ability to operate. So there were a number of those locations that were besieged. Often even um, they were uh, concentric sieges. You could, uh, in, in somewhere near Benish, uh, near Idlib, there was in fact a, a government circle and then a rebel circle and then a pro-government village uh, in, the, in the inner perimeter. So, there was an anthropologist or a report somewhere who called it a, a leopard skin kind of um, a map of the ethnicities and the confessions in Syria, and that sometimes translated into concentric sieges. Um, one more point I refer to in my article is that the government often tried to make a quid pro quo that if, uh, if we were to relieve um, the old city of Homs, for example, we should uh, then um, engage with the opposition to allow the relief 
of a, a government-affiliated village on the other side, and this was often um, something we were unable to deliver. Uh, it was re not regarded as uh, contrary to principle. It was regarded as a fair deal on the part of the government, but put us in a very, a very tricky position. So the besieging has become prominent recently, I think, because of Maedemia, and there was some uh, uh, terrible irony uh, of the chemicals, uh, weapons inspectors being allowed to go in there after months and months and months of the humanitarians not being allowed to go in there, and then a sudden release of civilians. Um, Eastern Huta now is, is perhaps the most uh, notorious, although the old city remains uh, in Homs uh, stuck. Um, Yes, local NGOs, the, the lack of partners is one of the uh, ways in which I feel the, the, the tools we had were, were not uh, suitable to the job. The UN doesn't run soup kitchens or field hospitals or patch up wounded people or deliver babies. It, it, it has to uh, have, uh, we call them implementing partners, which itself is a sort of, uh, seems almost a surreal terminology in Syria. Um, a lot of our pressure and our uh, humanitarian diplomacy was devoted to uh, uh, persuading the government that um, local NGOs could be useful, impartial, and apolitical, technically sound, and um, uh, useful and, and key. Uh, we now, I think, we heard recently several dozen local NGOs are being allowed to engage with the UN, but on the whole, um, it consists of delivering uh, goods and, and boxes of stuff rather than actual services uh, in, in the field. And those uh, local NGOs as often have a difficult relationship with SARC, actually, because um, they come from a, a, a fairly micro charitable background um, without the uh, backing of the principles of the, of the uh, Red Cross, Red Crescent movement, and sometimes there are, there are uh, friction between them. But um, I think the, the missing piece was the non-organized uh, uh, local effort. And I think Marama's description of, a, of a, an organizational effort that is, has no brand, has no banner, is a very interesting uh, point. Because I think that's where we are institutionally in, not set up to assist. And, and that perhaps would have been um, a, a, a very important opportunity. Uh, uh, Sean, what's the situation of ICRC on helping uh, these uh, uh, local uh, charity organizations or NGOs or local community? <coughs> well, um, I think, our, I think our, our, our principal partner is SARC, but, uh, but I think you know, Marwa uh, does make some extremely valid points about um, the role of uh, diaspora organizations in supporting um, uh, new local uh, neighborhood um, self-help type structures um, to, to deal with um, the huge and pressing humanitarian needs. I mean, I mean, let's face it, in a country where there are six million people internally displaced, that, that, that's just, you know, it's just a vast amount of need. And most of the assistance and, and, and care is actually, uh, you know, neighbor to neighbor, community to community. It's, 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 it's um, the, the, the international community's efforts, um, large as they are and successful as they are, as, 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 as in, in, in to some regard, as Matthew uh, rightly points out, um, it, you know, it's, it's, it, that is providing a, something of a, a, a of a backstop, but a lot of the assistance is really within Syria from Syrians to Syrians. And I think that it's very important to, to recognize that. Um, and I think Ben makes a very good point um, in that there is a disconnect between, you know, the sort of official assistance structures um, um, uh, and the kind of international humanitarian mechanisms um, and these more more local informal um, systems which are often might just be an extension of kind of natural local market mechanisms um, with perhaps some external cash diaspora uh, remittances uh, put in there to try to help people survive with a little bit of local farming and local produce generation and um, and, and, and plus the all important you know smuggling routes of which we we know little, but 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 assume there is there are many, um, and you know I think it has to be a, a working assumption that a lot of these besieged areas, where we you know, where we, we we believe living conditions are terrible, are basically sort of kept going through through smuggling routes and and sort of black market mechanisms and and all the devices that human ingenuity can come up with when 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 sur when, when survival is at stake. Um, just just I think to to to. Um, make the point that 
um, you know, sometimes sometimes there is a good sort of interplay between between sort of local solutions and and, and the international uh, presence. Um, uh, in July, in Aleppo, um, uh, the ICRC was able to negotiate um, with seven armed groups, which had s which were in control of an area surrounding an area within Aleppo that was government controlled, and where the the, the prison was. We were able to negotiate for SARC to be able to go in every day and provide a hot meal to the prisoners um, because the prisoners were imprisoned by people who were imprisoned. So, um, so, so they, were, they were at the bottom of the, of the food chain and were literally, literally dying of, of hunger. Um, so we were able for a period of three months to get food um, through, uh, through to these people who were in desperate need and had, had no ability to, to help themselves. Um, through through a process of negotiation with with the local partners. Now, unfortunately, that then fell apart as fighting in in, in Aleppo um, uh, resumed in, in in that neighborhood. But you know, it is it, you know there are examples out there of 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 uh, the international presence and, and and local initiative locking together successfully uh, to to bring assistance to where it's needed. Thank you very much. I think it's time to um, get uh, uh, the audience engaged. But before moving to that, I just one final thought. The crisis is still ongoing. There are promises of Geneva uh, peace talks to take place uh, uh, in, in January. But the humanitarian crisis is still ongoing. What are the ways to move forward? Are there any alternative uh, uh, tools or, or options to be in, in, in place, alternative solutions? And I put my question to all the speakers, Start, starting with you, Ben. What, what are your thoughts? Uh, I'm not, let's, I, I'd like to hear the questions, Lena. I'm uh, not sure I have the answers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, are there any ways in mind to move forward to Im improve the humanitarian aid as the crisis is continuing? I think there's a, I think there is a, a need for a little more honesty uh, and realism in the in the public space. Uh, frankly, I find it astonishing that our colleague from DFID can say that not one pound has been diverted. I, think, I don't think that's realistic. We in the UN have acknowledged that our food has been looted and our things have been burnt and stolen. Um, it's, it's not realistic, and I don't think the taxpayer, the, the, the good taxpayers of the world really need to be uh, infantilized in that way. There's obviously going to be problems. This is a very, very messy situation, and I think um, a, a little more acknowledgement of that would make uh, things better. Thank you. Matthew? <laughs> okay, well, thanks. I'll come back on that and then maybe also try and answer the question about how we can uh, try to do better. And no, I, I didn't say, I mean, I think I, when I answered the, the point about, was talking about the point of diversion, I recognized, as, as, as Ben has said, that, uh, that this is an incredibly messy situation. We have to be very, very vigilant. What I said was that um, so far in the reporting that we've had of our assistance, then we haven't had um, reports of large-scale diversion. Uh, in fact, we haven't had reports of diversion, as far as I know. I might, my, I've got one or two colleagues here who may be able to correct me, but we haven't had reports of that. I haven't said that not a penny has gone astray, because I can't guarantee that. But what I can guarantee is that we have all the monitoring systems in place that we can have. They are very robust, as Sean has said, about the systems in ICRC, and that's true of all the partners that we work through, and that we do everything we can to ensure that where there is diversion, then we're, that we're aware of that. So I don't think it's a question of infantilizing everybody. We know it's a really, really difficult situation. Of course, we can't guarantee that every penny and every pound uh, gets to exactly where it's meant to get to. What I'm saying is that so far, we are confident that certainly the vast bulk of our assistance is getting where it's supposed to be getting, and that we are trying to do everything we can to monitor and, and track so that, we're, so that we can keep a track of that. So I don't think it's a question of infantilizing anybody. It's uh, recognizing that the situation is really, really difficult. Um, what I did want to do, though, was also to, to try and answer the question about what more do we need to do, or how can we all collectively do better? And I think I'd just like to, I mean, there are many 
answers for that and people here will have answers too but I just wanted to maybe focus on four areas where I think perhaps we we need to do better and the first is one that we've returned to time and time again because it is so so important and that's the question about humanitarian access for those who are in besieged areas or in hard to reach areas I mean I think the latest figures I saw were something like between a quarter and half a million in besieged areas and a two and a half million in hard to reach areas you know that's far too many people who aren't getting the support they need. So I think we need collectively to do better at really shining a light on what is happening there, shining a light on where is it that it's impossible to get access, why is it, who is preventing the access, and do all we can really to, to shame them into, into allowing the access, um, and also try and identify some specific areas to make some incremental improvements in that if, you know, as we try and solve the, the whole problem. So I think that's important. And then also in line with that as well, in parallel with that, be as innovative as we can at trying to find ways through. And Mawira indicated some of the ways her organisation is trying to do that. I think we all need to try and be more innovative, more imaginative about ways of getting around the problem that we can't solve, but also at the same time trying to solve it. The second area, I think, is we've really got to make sure, and this is more perhaps an issue for the neighbouring countries, but in Syria too, but to try and make sure that there is a really coherent response. And in the countries where, which are hosting refugees, which are under huge strain, I think we need to be more imaginative about ways in which we can work with country systems to make sure that at the same time that we're providing assistance for refugees, we're also addressing the needs of the host communities, and as far as possible working with existing uh, institutions on the ground and systems. We mustn't fall into the trap of thinking we have a refugee problem over here and a fragility or a development problem over here. We have to kind of work in a much more coherent way and I think perhaps the international system is not ideally set up to do that. So I think we have to work extra hard to make sure that we, that we do do that and find new ways of working with, um, with all the institutions that can help. The third area is resources. I did touch on this a little bit earlier, but this crisis is absolutely massive. It is an extre extremely, extremely costly crisis. I don't know, the new appeals will be out in December. I don't know what they will be, but you know they will be several billion dollars that will need to be raised for next year. It's really important that you know, governments, public, everybody really pulls together to meet the need for resources. I mentioned the contributions of the British government. We're the second biggest bilateral donor. Others are very generous too. Kuwait, which is hosting a pledging conference in January, provided $300 million last year as a pledge. They delivered it through the UN in a very transparent and open way. Um, but we need more countries to step up to the plate um, on resources. And I hope that those of you um, including in the UK as well, but uh, particularly in other countries, will really put pressure on your governments to, uh, to make sure they do that. And then the fourth thing that I wanted to refer to was communication with the public. It is really important that we have a very mature conversation with our publics about <coughs> the situation in Syria, about the fact that, and, I, and you know, despite the, the, risks of, the risks that there are, the fact that a lot of assistance is getting through. Without the assistance being provided, the situation would be far, far more catastrophic than it is now. And I think it's really important that we engage the public. One way we're trying to do that in DFID is through an aid match program where we've agreed with four institutions that as they're having their winter appeals for Syria, DFID will match them pound for pound with Save the Children Fund, uh, with Oxfam, with UNICEF and with War Child. And so I, you know, that kind of thing I hope can connect with the public. I hope it will connect with people here and you'll be aware that if you contribute a pound to those appeals from those institutions, DFID will match that. But we need to find new ways to make sure that we keep this in the forefront of the public's mind so that they can support us as we try to, uh, to, do, uh, to provide the support that we provide. Thank, Thank you. you. Marwa, what do you think should be done? Um, there's a lot to be done. Um, I think I want to follow up um, on the point that Matthew made. We need to be innovative. In five years' time, uh, in ten years' time, when the conflict ends, we don't want to look back and say, ah, we could have done this. That we could have opened up humanitarian corridors. We could have uh, worked through the civil society organisations. We don't want to look back and, and in regret, as we've done in previous crises um, in the past. We need to push more openly for humanitarian corridors. This is an absolute must people are in need of dire assistance. The civil society organisations, there is so much that we can do. Um, we need the expertise of international um, agencies 
to be inside Syria, to be providing assistance um, through those humanitarian corridors which need to be safeguarded and which need to be set up. We do not know how much longer that this conflict can be going on for and it, it's only deteriorating day by day. We need to be more open about the pressure that we're implementing. Yes, it's very important to do some behind the door discussions, but we also need to be very vocal. People need to be know that we, you know, we need to we, we need to start to a certain extent naming and shaming. Um, we need to put pressure. Um, the media, the, the broadcasters here I in the UK and abroad, we are focusing too much on the 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 fighting. We're focusing too much on. Um, X fighting X, the 1400 factions that ha have arisen, we are forgetting the humanitarian crisis. And this is a fault uh, and a shortcoming perhaps even of the uh, of the broadcasters. And I would urge more broadcasters to focus on the humanitarian crisis rather than the conflict, um, which w rather than the crisis and uh, the conflict itself. Furthermore, and, and probably lastly, um, I would like to say the, the starving children uh, those people who are under siege, that should be a red line just as much as the chemical weapons were a red line. The chemical weapons killed 1,400 people, perhaps. Um, however, on a daily basis, 200 people are dying, not because of shelling anymore, not because of the fight, but because they are starving, they are hungry, and they need medical assistance, which they do not have access. So just as they were red lines, humanitarian um, need and salvation is also a red line. Um, and I'd like to urge the uh, the international community um, and the broadcast to, to, to look at that. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Sean, what, what should be done uh, more? And also, do you think that uh, more pressure, more public pressure on the government might help? Um, I, don't, I certainly don't want to give a, a, a message of, of hopelessness, but I, I do think we need to issue a message of, of that are, that are of, of modesty. Um, um, for the aspirations for humanitarian assistance because um, we didn't cause the conflict and we will not solve the conflict, but the conflict is the problem. Um, and what we can do is very much the, the, the subject of um, uh, sets of political decisions and political conversations that set the space in which we can operate and uh, achieve something to meet the needs that exist. So I think um, we need to be, we need to acknowledge our relative lack of power um, as, as humanitarians. Um, we need to raise our voice, um, uh, our voice, but, 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 but I do feel our voices are, 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 are quite loud already. Um, I, I think you would probably have to have uh, been in a deep hole in the ground for the last couple of years not to realize there's a very hideous and large and pressing uh, humanitarian crisis in Syria. But nevertheless, we need to keep shining a spotlight on that. But we also need to, to d you know, reflect some of that light um, onto, onto uh, you know, state leaders um, who will ultimately uh, bring the right influence to bear to um, have this, have this uh, conflict end. And that, that, is the, that is the best way uh, to bring to bring relief uh, to the people of Syria. Thank you, Emanuela. Final thought. Yes, and I think I wanted to pick up on some of the comments made. Um, and I think we we humanitarians and possibly as a consequence the media have failed to bring um, to the attention of the world the nature and extent of the humanitarian crisis. I think we have been very good at highlighting the protection crisis, uh, less so the humanitarian one, quite frankly. Um, people facing extreme shortages and the need for medical supplies. And I think we should all be doing more to highlight these very specific needs in the chaos that is Syria today. Um, and perhaps um, related to this, it it's also reflects an approach that I feel we humanitarian have been taking. We've been adopting too much of a, a binary approach to access all or nothing. While, and Ben, I realize you've been following this far more closely more recently than I, but that's the impression very much I, I get, that we, it, it seems as if we've been asking for all access by all actors to all places at all times to carry out all kinds of relief operations. While we have, might have far more success if we adopt a more incremental approach and try to negotiate and obtain um, 
the green lights by all the parties concerned, and we've been focusing on the government's restrictions, but let's not forget that there's a multitude of other actors involved who are also severely hampering relief operations. And if we focus on engaging with them to meet specific needs in specific areas at specific times and achieving access um, incrementally, we might have more <coughs> success. At, um, as a final thought, at a higher level, I wonder whether perhaps um, the political focus on cross-border operations that we've seen notably in New York has not been counterproductive um, at field level and undermined um, negotiations on, on cross-line and on access more generally. Thank you very much. Maybe it's time to hear from you. I'm sure you have many questions. Uh, can I ask you just introduce yourself and uh, see, uh, say who you want to, to ask for? So we'll start. Yeah. 